So quick thank you to one of our favorite sponsors down at BetterHelp. BetterHelp supports your mental health goals every step of the way and just about every day. Listeners get 10% off their first month when visiting our sponsor at BetterHelp.com slash Funches. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Funches for 10% off your first month. It's about Thank you for listening to the podcast. Thank you for supporting me in any way that you do. If you stumble across these affirmations, uh, please give a sub up on the on the YouTube or, or uh, just follow me. Buy a ticket to one of my shows. I'm going back on the road. Hopefully everything is fluid and in motion. But I believe I will be in Denver for my birthday, March 10th through the 12th. March 12th is my 39th birthday, uh, which is not a big deal, which is why I'm not going to be at home. I'll be at road doing some stand-up comedy and i would love if you were there to support me at comedy works in denver uh march the following weekend march 17th through the 19th i will be in my own stopping grounds where i started comedy which is a good thing because it feels like i'm starting comedy all over again i will be at helium comedy club in portland oregon uh so please come out and support me buy some tickets because i need your support and love to uh progress to and feel loved and feel like i can try new things i'm not i haven't done comedy uh this year yet so i would enjoy uh, a supportive environment so please get some tickets if you can denver and portland uh, i had a set in phoenix but then i found out that there's no any no, no type of uh you know covid requirements and right now that's not good for me or my family so i had to uh, reschedule that one but hopefully i'll be back in arizona uh sometime soon other than that uh, you know how to support the podcast. Patreon.com slash getting better with Ron is the way you can get exclusive episodes. You can get some thank you notes. You can get some wonderful items. Just go over to patreon.com slash getting better with Ron. If you'd like to support this podcast directly, if it's helped you out in some form, I would appreciate that. Uh, you can get t-shirts at comedianteas.com. Look in the Ron Funches store. Uh, and you can join the Twitch, twitch.tv and Ron underscore funches we playing games we're watching wrestling we got the funches fantasy league going strong uh we did our royal rumble pool this last weekend so we're just hanging out being nerdy and stupid and weird so if you want to come join us you're welcome to oh it's a good thing i like man this light's good for me today my skin is good today i'm very excited about it that's another reason why you should check out the youtube to see how cocoa buttery glowy my skin is right now so <laughs> other than that you know how we start the podcast i hope you're feeling loved i hope you're feeling brave i hope you're feeling strong i hope you're feeling all types of things i know the order was different i know halston i can see it in your face uh but it's mostly because this is one of those weeks where i'm not feeling that great about it and that's okay too uh it's been a rough last couple of weeks with my son having uh my son got covid and that made everything kind of scary around the house a lot of people freaking out um and then a lot of people including myself not handling those freakouts well uh so it's just a harsh time right now and it's difficult to to deal with life <laughs> it seems hard right now because of the little things that you have uh get added on to the fact that we're still in a big major pandemic and some people uh you know and there's no uniform way of being told how to deal with it some people are very concerned and locked down and some people are out living their lives and living well and i don't know what is right i don't know what is wrong i know you can only do what you need to do to support your family and support your mental health so uh, if you're not feeling brave right now that is quite okay i'm not feeling that brave right now i'm scared all the time I'm scared when I go to work that I'm going to get sick or come home and get my wife sick or get my son sick. 
And that's terrifying to me. If you're not feeling strong right now, that's okay. I don't feel too terribly strong. I'm I, I'm happy with some of the things I've been doing. You know, that's a lot. I feel pretty strong right now. Even though I don't feel brave, I feel very strong. And that's okay because I'm doing things even though I don't feel brave. And that is a, a big part of what strength is. It's not the absence of fear. It is acting and continue to push forward in the face of fear. And whatever you need to do to uh, get by and feel loved and feel happy is a-okay with me. If you don't feel brave, it does not mean you are not strong, but you are certainly loved. I know that for a fact, even though sometimes it doesn't feel that way. It feels like if we were loved and supported by this universe, why would we be going through so many issues and so many trials and so many things that seem chaotic and out of our control? Uh, and that's just what the wheel of life is, ups and downs. And that's how what we do within that wheel, how we stay balanced in the middle is what determines our happiness uh, to not to get away from the edges and the fringes where we are thrown by that wheel, where you feel those downs and you feel those highs so very uh, aggressively and get to a point where you're riding in the middle, even though there are downs, even though they are ups, you ride, ride right into in that was it a fulcrum? I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, the middle of the wheel, right in that base. That's what you want to be. Uh, and just uh, a lesson I need and I think something we all need is just to continue to have empathy with each other. And to you never know what someone else is going through right now. And I just feel like rules that we followed in the past and things that we did of um, stopping ourselves from enjoy truly enjoying our lives or saying what we really mean or not being fully our, our, our full honest self and um, saying what you really need in your life and saying what you want and trying to not wait for, if you're a spiritual person, not wait for heaven, but to search and reach for your happiness and for your heaven on earth. And that is difficult to get sometimes, uh, most of the time, if not all the time. But I think the more we're honest with ourselves, the more we're true with our, our, our beliefs and what we are, the closer that we can get to that. I mean, that's how I found comedy. If it wasn't for me being true to myself and true to my beliefs at a time when people told me that this was the absolute worst thing to do in my life when I was the father of a two-year-old kid and couldn't support myself and couldn't support him and the fact that I wanted to go do stand-up comedy uh, was seen as a, a, the absolute worst thing to do. But I knew deep in my heart that this is who I was and this is who I needed to be. And that's what... what uh, the path I needed to follow and it turned out okay for me and even if it hadn't turned out where I was on TV and a bunch of stuff I still would be enjoying it just being able to pay my bills doing comedy is all I've ever wanted uh, and so I just wish that for everyone and, and continue for myself just to be my unique self, be truly who I want to be, say what I need to be happy and, and, and pursue and go after my happiness while I'm here on earth and not wait for it and not think that, um, you know, what they always say, a thing like, you know, that, that to the meek go the spoils. I don't believe that necessarily be true. I think you got to go out there and grab what you want and get what you want right now and be happy. There's a way for, for you to enjoy your life. If there's a lady on 90 Day Fiance becoming a fart millionaire or for selling her farts, then you gotta, there's gotta be something for you, for you to reach your happiness. She That's how she got her happiness, and that looks weird to everybody else. And, <laughs> but it's what works for her, and you gotta find out what works for you and what makes you... Uh, your heart sing and your soul happy and it might not be the same thing that works for everybody you know so i just hope that you're spending time with the people that you truly love and that you enjoy and that you appreciate them and that you um 
even though things are rough. And because I feel like so many people, we fall in this trap of we just want to continue to complain about how rough things are. And we just keep going like, oh, 2021, 2022. It's like every year fucking sucks. And every year is amazing. And every year somebody's headed down. And every year somebody accomplishes dreams they never thought they would see. I'm deeply inspired when I see things like Abbott Elementary or... um, grand crew with these these wonderful funny or as we see it these these just unique tales these black shows these shows about autism these shows about representation things that i didn't think i would see just two three years ago and i see people achieving their dreams and i see people reaching what they um, thought they never would reach and that continue that pushes me to keep going even when there's times where i think i won't reach my goals and i think there's times where i won't uh, get to where i want to go so um, I just hope that you keep pushing because what else we got to do? You know, there ain't no really else, else, nothing to do. You know, you either living, pushing or you dying, you know, you either swimming, you either just keep swimming or you that chum, you know how it go. You know what I mean? Let's get into our guest. It's a comedian. He's probably somebody you never heard of. <laughs> But he's amazing. He's really funny. He's a true uh, comic, true craftsman, and someone I really enjoy as a mind. And um, from talking with him, just seems to be a good father and husband and a guy out there plugging away. And that's what we try to do. He has the Comedy Store podcast. He has his own uh, EP coming out on Comedy Store Records. He has Rick talks to strangers which is a podcast where he talks to strangers so you could possibly be a guest you can catch him at the com he's a regular at the comedy store and he deserves to be there because he's a killer enjoy this conversation with my friend rick ingram you're just mad because i can afford to take my mom out to jinkies and pay half the bill well richard (laughs) <laughs> i never the whole time i just called you rick and i never in my whole life was like oh that's short for richard in my yeah. whole life wow i i had a moment there where i'm like oh shit i'm already in trouble what i, I know I, me even saying it i felt like i better follow up where like me and your, my, and your mom and i were disappointed in you <laughs> uh Ah, I'm happy to have you on the podcast. Thank you for coming. I'm I I want to. I usually get started by telling people why I wanted them on the podcast, um, and it's fun because I get to give you praise. This is great. I wanted to do interview in the podcast. Uh, a because I don't know a lot about you, even though I see you a lot at the comedy store. We perform together often. Um, yeah. you're one of the people I see that see the most there. Um. And you're one of my favorites. You're what I like about you. What I enjoy about your, your you and your skill set. Even though I'd say that we're probably, um, I wouldn't say that we're actually that different. I, but because we, I think we both really enjoy the um, rules of comedy. We enjoy like the building and set up punchline and, and and sometimes callbacks. I think you do more crowd work certainly than I do. But um, our styles and the way that we 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 use the same kind of tool sets are very different. But yeah. I've always had such a a respect for you and your comedy you're one of my favorite comedians to watch because whenever i see you perform you're always fearless you always you never really i've or at least i've never seen you i don't know about the road but i've never seen you really pander to anything you always come out there with your mission and you and, and you go out there and you execute your game plan and um when i think about people who when I'm on the road and I see some Uber driver, they ask me what I do or whatever. And they're always like, Oh, comedy's not the same anymore. You can't say what you want anymore. I'm always like, you've never, obviously you've never seen Rick Ingram because you're always a person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that I think of when I hear them say that I'm like, you're not, you're not well versed. You're not a student of the game because there's certainly are people who are doing whatever they, they feel like and what they want to do. And so I just wanted to m- know a little bit more about you. So, Oh, Thank right. you for coming. I appreciate you having me. So, um, tell me about how you got started. Where are you from? Are you from Kansas, Kansas, Kansas City? I am from Kansas. Um, I'm suburbs, Kansas City. Uh, grew up there and uh, started comedy there, and uh, a now no longer existing comedy club. And uh, yeah. I moved to LA when I was 21, basically as soon as I could get into comedy clubs. 
uh, I moved, tried to decide between LA and New York and um, made my visits during the winter and it uh, quickly became a better option to go to LA. So that's, uh, that's kind of how I got into the comedy in the LA scene. What was your introduction into comedy? What made you, uh, I mean, clearly you must fall in love with it at such an early age to be like, I'm going to go as soon as I'm 21 years old and <laughs> move to one of these two places. So what what, who, what got you interested? Uh, I, originally, I wanted to be on like SNL. Um, I did impressions. That's how I started. Um, in terms of stand-up, uh, Chris Rock, Bring the Pain was kind of the the first comedy special i saw where i'm like this is what i want to do um and then from that i you know i got into lots of different more into george carlin and um that kind of i guess the older comedy that i I hadn't seen it wasn't as readily available um obviously in the 90s so you know i'd go to video library and rent whatever comedy specials they had um that was our local our local video store that we used because um, we, we didn't support Blockbuster and my family because they donated money to uh, pro-life uh, or, ordeals or something. And uh, so my parents were, they were opposed to that. And so we went to Video Library, which had an enormous adult uh, film section, which was always exciting. Mm-hmm. Get to see, you know, your friend's dad's perusing the porn section and then you know hot topic at school that week that kind of thing did they separate it at all with beads or any type of Uh, thing there there was a just a rope it's similar to um like going from the parking lot to the inside the building at the comedy store so you could clearly see everybody but uh if you were a, a child and you went underneath the ropes then someone from video library would come tell you it was not an appropriate section for you First of all, what a, a very basic name for a place where they're just like, look, we got a library of videos, yep. we're a video library. Except for you yep. have to, you got, you have to bring them back and return them. I guess yep. the only difference is you pay, yep. as opposed to. So that's a very literal name, and I enjoy it. Uh, um, I had a place <clears throat> it was kind of similar where. My mom would take me to this place, Hollywood Video in Chicago, and same story. They they had, were the place that was outside the chain, and then, but they had a row of beads. And sometimes my mom would go into this beaded area, and I'd have to either choose between getting a pro wrestling VHS or a comedy one, depending on if I had seen them all. Right. Uh, so I understand that. So, um, but that's also leads me to another story. So your parents were anti the pro-life blockbuster statement. Yeah, I, I just I remember asking because my friends always went to Blockbuster. And I remember being like, why don't we just go to Blockbuster? And I remember my mom saying like, oh, well, they they donate money to pro-life. Um, I don't know if it was charities or, you know, movements, whatever the deal was. So um I just kind of accepted it, like, all right, whatever. Did you grow up in a a pro, like a progressive family, like that, or what? what? I did did not know that about you. Yeah, we were the we were the liberals in Kansas. A a lot of my friends' parents uh, were not happy about my friendship with their children. Um, So there was you were like a de facto black person. (laughs) Yeah, kind of. (laughs) I mean, it it was uh, when I was. When I was younger in elementary school, my best friend was the only black kid at our school. And um, I, I remember thinking, it's not weird. I just didn't know any better. And it wasn't until we got older that I realized like, oh, this is this is kind of bizarre that for Tamru more than for me, I guess. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it made sense. We had his birthday was the same as my brother's birthday you know as a second grader that's a good enough reason to be best friends (laughs) that is really all it takes is you you got what we got in common birthday same favorite cartoon whatever you got same lunchbox yeah and then uh, in the fifth grade when they did uh that was the the one black teacher in the school was my fifth grade teacher and we did uh, like a martin luther king day presentation 
and they made me be one of the black people on the bus just because I was friends with Tamru. <laughs> Which, looking back, I'm like, this really seems inappropriate, but you know. And did they 19... cast people who were against it? Did they have people? Did they have some of the other white yeah. students? Oh yeah, protesting. They, you know, they said, "Carl, you're obviously a racist. Uh, <laughs> you might actually be the bus driver." <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, it was. It was a standard uh, suburban, what I like to refer to as a uh, dinner table racist community mm-hmm. um you know the people weren't part of the clan but there was definitely conversations uh being held at their homes that were not something that would be smiled upon yeah no i grew up in it's been a lot of time in salem oregon i understand for yeah. sure so is that one of the things that also motivated you to get out of town as quickly as possible i mean pretty much everything motivated me to get out of town you know, I look at it now. I, I think Kansas City was a great place to to be from. It's just not a great place to be for me, I suppose. I know there are lots of people that love it there. And, you know, it, it's it's a nice enough place, I guess. But there's just a it's it, it feels like it's about 40 years behind the times at all times. So like when I go back there and I get off a plane, it feels like I just traveled on a time machine it's like maybe 1993 at this point (laughs) yeah well any place that lets patrick mahomes brother run rampant unbelievable you you can't unbelievable unacceptable truly not doing anything uh but i understand i mean again that reminds me of my my uh growing up as a teen in salem oregon after i moved from chicago it was the same atmosphere of like Oh, it isn't really like, okay. There were, I mean, actually there was, there was a couple of camps. There were people who were like, I'm going to just be weird and freaky and make this place as artsy as I can in this corporate little area are the people who are just like, well, I'm stuck here. I'm going to live out here and just trying to find a good government job or whatever. (laughs) Or the third option was I'm going to get out of town and go to Portland or go wherever, you know? And, it's very um i mean i just think that's interesting and 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 shows a lot of strength in you to be like i can't i'm not going to try to make this work out here i'm going to try to i need to go to a place where i can feel like i can become what i want to become yeah yeah i I mean as soon as i got done with high school I, i um i got accepted and to a film school in santa fe new mexico and I had no desire to go there, but it was just a different place. So I was just like, sure. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. And I went there for a semester and that was terrible too. Um, And I was just like, oh, this isn't really any better. It's a little, it's a little better, but it was, it was almost, um, it was kind of small townish and very artsy, which is not really my style either. Um, So I went back, I went to KU for, a few semesters um basically just waiting till i was old enough to get in and then at that point i dropped out and moved to la okay now tell me about moving to la at such a young age and in like because to me one of the things that i was co- kind of cognizant about was that i was like well, I mean, I think if I had had my way i would have been like i'm just moving to la as soon as i can but i had my son like two years before I started comedy. And so I had to be like, well, I need to, it's going to be better for me to just stay where I am and just keep, keep going. And luckily I was like close enough to Portland and, and that scene was developing at at the rate that I was developing, but to go immediately into a place like LA, it seems so difficult. Um, And so just, I mean, maybe I'm just putting words in your mouth. Tell me what it's like. Tell me what it was like for you. Uh, well, I moved to LA. I was, um, I was heartbroken. I had just witnessed my girlfriend, uh, cheating on me. And so I, I, I showed up and I was basically rock bottom and it worked out wonderfully in terms of the disappointment and the struggle of the first couple of years. Um, it didn't really bother me that much cause it, it seemed better. Like, I, I guess I always kind of felt like I was, uh, you know, I was weird. I was kind of the freak, 
And when I moved to LA, it was the most normal I ever felt in my life. Just being around LA people, I was just like, oh, you know what? I'm actually kind of a decent person. <laughs> and it's not solely based on, you know, my belief in Jesus, which was the basis for being a good person in Kansas. So, um, but you know, it was a struggle. I worked in restaurants and, um, I lucked out, I should lucked out. I lucked out and I got a, a doorman job at the comedy store, um, after doing open mic for like six months. And so, um, you know, it was nice in terms of, I felt like I had a club that, um, was already kind of embracing me. Um, back then the comedy store was very dead. There was, there was no people coming to see shows there, but open mic night was Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. And so I got a lot of stage time. I got to do my employee spots, uh, you know, at least three nights a week. And then some of the other nights I got to do belly room shows and stuff like that. So, um, it, it, you know, it was, it was a struggle for sure, but I was so young and dumb and, you know, I, I didn't have kids until five years ago. So I didn't have any responsibility. It was just me being, you know, broke, but enjoying myself, I guess. So it, it was, it definitely was hard, but you know, I got by, I just smoked a lot of weed and, um, drank quite a bit and, um, I had a good time. It was fun. It was a different, the comedy store was very different then, but it was, it was more like, um, it was more like a dive bar than anything, mm -hmm. but it had that cheers kind of feeling to it where, you know, I'd show up any night, even if I wasn't working and I would see five or six of my good friends and a lot of the same, uh, guys that are kind of part of our generation of, uh, comedians were, we're starting out there and I got to watch some of the guys who are now huge, like Sebastian and people like that when they were, you know, he was still working at a restaurant and he would show up in his, his suit from working at the four seasons or whatever and do his spot and then leave. And, um, so it was a, it was a good college of comedy in that aspect of watching the people who are doing well, seeing what doesn't work, which is an enormous advantage. Uh, when you're young and you know you, you're not set in your what you believe your path of comedy is um so it was good and i also like that because it makes things um seem more attainable and real when you when you see the whole grind of people when you know it isn't i think sometimes when it's so far you just like this person just pops up or they just it seems like they've automatically, even if you yourself are in the same industry, you're just like, oh, it must have just been fun for them, fine for them. But when you get to actually, it's one of the things I love and, and, and one of the things that's still in a business that can make you feel jaded quickly or, or, or just stomps on your dreams all the time. And even when you're having positive mo moments, they'll find a way to be rude about it, which is always fun to me. Uh, but like, there's still such this magic to it when you think of someone like Sebastian or to me, like when I think about like, like Leslie, Leslie Jones, when you're like, I was just, you just would hang out with her at any given time in the belly room. She didn't have shit going on. Not a goddamn thing. Just hanging yeah. out, being uh, like funny as shit and kind of angry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then the next thing you know, she's a fucking got tens of millions of dollars. Yeah. Uh, I remember when Leslie showed up, she would always tell me, she'd be like, oh, I gotta, I gotta be more like you. You're just so free and you do whatever you want you say whatever you want i'm just like yeah it's not really working for me and then <laughs> she really crushed it where i'm just like damn she she really figured out how to do this the right way but it came late in life for her but you know like you said man she's doing well so it's fun it's fun to see the evolution of people like that yeah truly i love it what do you um like about the comedy store now i i love the comedy store post covid shut down i think it's fun it's uh there's I, I guess more of a kind of more of a brotherhood i guess in terms of how the comics treat each other mm -hmm. I, I don't know if it's just everyone having comedy taken away from them for a while but people are just a lot more respectful it's it's uh 
it's an interesting comeback, I guess, in a way where it's like, uh, you know, people that I've talked to for years, but not in any sort of uh, deep conversation. Now I have extended conversations with, and, um, you know, I don't get people complaining about me doing crowd work anymore, which is nice. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know. I think it's great. You know, comedy crowds, when we first reopened, were so excited to see anything. It was uh, it was really nice. And on top of that, the like the the friend who comes to the comedy show but doesn't really like comedy wasn't coming to comedy shows because it was like sixty dollars or something ridiculous. Mm-hmm. So it was genuinely just people who wanted to go laugh and have fun. Yeah, no, oh, that's very well said. I think that's what what I really love about it because it seemed like anyone who who was coming out was like because they just really miss and want to be a part of comedy again and everyone was kind of like restarting in ways and having to work things out and we were all having to see each other and almost like this open mic seeing each other as if we were starting our careers over again and it yeah and then that seeing people backstage sweating and going over notes and going over things. It was, it made it so nice again. I'd be like, Oh, this is what it felt like when I started. And it's, um, makes it seem pure again. We are like, I, I, I want to, because I mean, there's one thing I remember when I would read as a teenager, I would read Patton Oswalt's like blog that he put out on this thing called the spew. And he would always talk about like being part through the ups and downs of comedy. And I'd always felt like, in a lot of ways, I'd been lucky that like I had been really working the whole time during the boom. Like everything was going up and up and up. Not you know necessarily for me, but for comedy, it seemed right. like things were just going up and up and up. And this was the first time where I can be like, oh okay, no, now I see what it's like yeah. to have to actually weather things out and go through a career. And it makes yeah. me um more determined, if anything. Yeah, it was not when my first sets back. I I didn't perform at all um, throughout the the initial lockdowns, I guess. Um, and so I didn't I didn't performed in like thirteen months or something when the comedy store reopened. And th- that whole first week before every set was like the first time in a decade where I like I felt nervous. You know, like I had like that panic where I'm just like, what do I, what do what do I do? What am I going to say? And it was nice. It was, it was like refreshing in a way to feel that again, where I'm just like, okay. And then it would take, you know, a minute each time of getting on stage. And then the, the first night back, it took me about 30 seconds before I was just like, oh yeah, this is what I need. And then I had that, it was like, I can only describe it as a heroin addict shooting up for the first time. And in, in a year where you're just like, oh my God, it, it was, uh, it was really, it was a cool feeling. And at the same time, I'm just like, well, I'm seriously addicted to performing. This is, it's a crazy feeling. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Even when you said the heroin part, I, I just liked it. I didn't go like, ew, <laughs> gross. I was like, yes, I want that heroin. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And despite never having done heroin, I would imagine that's the same vibe. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to ask you about like your your goals. That's one thing we like to talk about. Well, you know what? Before I get to the goal portion, I want to know about stuff that you don't really. I don't hear you talk much about on stage, which is like um, you being a dad and, and and husband and stuff. Would you? You said you, you, five. So your oldest is five. Then is what you're telling me. Yeah, yeah. I have and a you, five five year old daughter and a one and a half year old son. Tell me a bit about what fatherhood Rick is like and what you enjoy. What what's what's the cause there's the guy, there's a big difference between the one who's on Twitter trying to burn the world down and what I see on stage. And then when I went to your Instagram, I was like, oh, this is a completely different guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I almost felt like like I need diff two Instagrams because the one I have forever is just like family stuff and then people are just like what is this and i'm like <laughs> oh they saw me performing <laughs> they don't understand that there's a, a jekyll and hyde to me um 
Yeah, it's uh, I, it, it's fun. I, I love being a dad. It's great. It's exhausting, but you know, it's definitely a different side of me. Um, you know, I came from a big family, so it's uh, it's kind of cool. I my wife has a regular job and works, and I watch the kids during the day, and um, you know, it's fun. My my five year old is is brilliant. She's like super gifted and way smarter than I ever was. So um, it's an interesting, it's definitely an interesting journey. She's uh, in kindergarten now. And so it's the first time I'm dealing with real school, that kind of thing. Uh, I do live in constant fear that the administrators and teachers at her school are going to somehow come across some of my comedy clips and, um, and the judgment that will most likely come from that. Uh, she does have a tendency to misbehave a little bit. And I know <laughs> that that is a hundred percent because, um, you know, I, I'm raising her <laughs> and, uh, the values that I'm, I'm showing her are important, probably aren't the standard, you know, parental guidance. Um, Will you expound on that? What, give me an example. Um, she's, she's very confident in that. Um, she's right in that um, she doesn't she shouldn't feel any fear that, you know, she. The way she uh, teaches her teachers, for instance, is as if they're her equals and not that they're her instructor. So um, and there's a lot of talking back and things of that nature where, you know, when they tell me and like uh, Julia did this today, I'll be like, awesome. But then I have to put on my parent face and be like, oh, I have no idea why she would do that. That's crazy. Um, but yeah, I don't, it's, uh, it's interesting. And now and with my one and a half year old, you know, it's uh, a boy. So it's a whole different ball game and um, it's fun. He's more, I don't I mean, know how to describe it. It's more like he's like my buddy, I guess, you know. But my daughter, I am very protective, like overprotective of her and making sure, you know, she's a strong woman and stuff. But um, with my son, it's just it's cool. It's like it's like having a buddy to hang out with. I just got him a little little Tykes basketball goal. And um, now he spends a good portion of his time doing the uh, countdown as if the clock is running down and, <laughs> and slam dunking it and just a, a lot of celebrating. Uh, you know, that he wins the game every time because he shoots the ball from two inches away. You got to teach him sportsmanship. You got to teach him how to act like he's been there before. That's right. <laughs> exactly right. The, the problem is, is, athletically, I've never been there before. <laughs> every every athletic achievement of my life was uh, purely accidental, so... <laughs> Well, I don't have any. I never did a team sport in my life. I guess one, my only one is that I did a pro wrestling match in my late 30s. None as a teen. I did skateboarding for one winter in Chicago, which when you learn, that's not, yeah, you shouldn't because there's yeah, ice everywhere. No, and you fall and you hurt yourself. And that's what happened to me. And I was yeah. like, I'm out of the game. Out I rode a skateboard one time in my life. One time. My friend had a skateboard. He was telling me how cool it was. I rode about six feet before it flipped out from my legs, and I never again stepped on a skateboard. That's fun, and that also reminds me of my absolute, as we're talking all skateboard stories, my favorite skateboard story is my son's skateboard story. My son was turning, I believe, 15 or 16 years old, and he was just begging me for a skateboard for Christmas. Begging me, just like, that's all I want is a skateboard. It seemed, you know, you know, we all get that age where you're like, skateboarding is cool. For me, yeah. when I was younger, it was ninjas because of three ninjas and things of like that, and, uh, and yeah. Beverly Hills Ninja. Uh, and yeah. so I got him a skateboard for Christmas, got him a helmet, got him knee pads, got him elbow pads, got him all suited up, got to take the skateboard outside. He literally puts one foot on the skateboard, doesn't even push off, and then just goes, no. <laughs> and then it goes right back upstairs to play video games. Smart. That's the smartest kid I've ever heard. As soon as as soon as I felt slightly at, at, uh, like I wasn't at ease, I'm just like, no, this isn't for me. I can't do this. Yeah. We're not meant to roll. 
I wasted a lot of money. I wish that, yes, if there had just been one time where I had just let him practice on anyone else's, I would have been out of that position. It's one of our favorite sponsors. We're all about getting better. And a big part about getting better is supporting your mental health. It's not just about listening to podcasts about self-help. It's not just about going out there and reading some books. It's about getting some licensed professional therapy from people who really are out there to support you. And that's why we enjoy BetterHelp. BetterHelp is there to ask you what is stopping you from achieving your goals what are you doing to self-sabotage yourself like things that i used to do a uh, low self-esteem just not believing in myself and i had to unpack some childhood trauma and some issues with therapy and better help is there for you they can you can connect in under 48 hours it is not a crisis line again it is not a self-help line it is professional counseling done securely online so there is no waiting room there is no drive over to your therapist's office it is just you connecting with someone in the comfort of your own home well ever having to leave that house. The service is available for clients worldwide. They have licensed professional counselors who specialize in depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, sleeping issues, trauma, and much more more it is convenient professional affordable and you never have to believe me check out the testimonials posted daily on their site again it is not a crisis line if you are in need of immediate help please contact a crisis line in in your area and know that you are loved and i want you to start living a happier life today as a listener you'll get 10 percent off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash Funches. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. That is BetterHelp. H-E-L-P dot com slash Funches. Thank you for sponsoring BetterHelp. How old were you when you uh, became a dad? 20. 20. Wow. Yeah. That's nuts. Yeah. Don't recommend it, but then also I do recommend it for me because it worked out well for me. Motivated me really focused me i didn't have a lot of uh uh self-esteem i guess would be the word i didn't have a lot of like uh where i'm like oh i need to live at a certain level but when i had my son i was like i can't put my i can't have my son living in a shitty apartment and that really uh so that changed a lot of my focus uh for my question for you is like had you noticed it changed with your stand-up or anything when 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 you started having kids uh, I, I I guess the the main difference is I started thinking about uh, how I can shape my comedy uh, to where it would be appropriate for uh, anything other than live performance. Mm-hmm. Um, just ways to advance my career. Like I, I've always just been very focused on. I just want to be like a pure comedian that you know says what I want to say, d- does does what I want to do. And it works out great for performing, but, you know, no one wants to put that on television. Uh, Like you were saying with the Uber drivers, where it's like, you can absolutely say whatever you want. And if you present it in the right way, crowds will be happy to hear it. But Comedy Central is not going to, you know, offer you a deal for something. Um, I, I would basically only did crowd work for a really long time. And I, I truly believed that if I showed that I was good at it and that I was uh, in control, you know, I guess masterful in the way that it was presented so that it wasn't chaos, that I would be able to go do something with it. But I have accepted at this point that that is not the case. Hmm. Um, no one, no one is willing to take a risk in terms of, you know, filming something that they don't know what's going to happen. So since my kids have been born, I I focused a lot more on trying to come up with actual material, even if it's just kind of rants um, about, you know, my my general feelings on things in a a humorous way. Um, And then just, I, I guess, changing it, not changing it, but just 
altering the way I, I present it so that it's not so in your face and offensive. Um, even though it still is, I can't get that part out of me, I guess, but uh, just make it so that it's, it's a sellable presentation. Yeah. Kind of the same thing you were talking about where it's just, you got, you have, you have to earn a certain amount to provide, I guess is a, the way of saying it. <laughs> I understood completely. And I always, um, I mean, I think that's a way, something I knew about myself in my comedy early, where I was like, I had to find ways, like, I like to say certain things. I like to, um, I mean, I'll be, I'll <laughs> go out there and bring up like Jim Crow laws and things of that nature. But if I came out there and was just like, what you guys, you guys remember Jim Crow laws, it won't go <laughs> well, you know? Like, I have to like, put it into something i have to hide it in a, yeah. in a, in a cookie and yeah. and that's just something i learned pretty early for me uh but in the way that i mean and that's something i think you do pretty well actually i think you you've been the material i've been seeing you do lately is very um I, I forget, palatable is the word I want to look for, but um, it's less, I guess over the last couple of years, a little less, yes, less ranty, less angry, and more like, oh, this is this guy's viewpoint and this is his life right now. And I, I think it, I've seen a lot of growth in your material the last few years. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm certainly trying. So I guess that might be it more than anything. It's just effort, um, just putting forth an actual effort to make something better than what it was well that leads right directly into the question i wanted to ask about goals what are you working on rick what are you trying to do whether family wise health wise career wise i was in one of the reasons i want to ask is that i i i don't think i want i do research when i look up when i'm about to interview people you got one of the shortest bios in my life for this one <laughs> You got the ringers and yeah. then you did some commercials. I think I remember the one about the overactive bladder because your face, I remember your face in it. Yeah. Uh, so, but tell me now you got focus, you got that family, you got things going on. What are your goals right now, Rick? I, my, my immediate goal is uh, I would like to, to film a special. Um, what I'll be able to do with it. I'm not sure, even if it's just putting it out on YouTube and uh, I guess gaining some notoriety. Um, I'm doing some some EPs, uh, just some like album stuff with a comedy store. Um, so we're just recording sets right now and kind of picking and choosing some of the best crowd work out of it and um, gonna start releasing those this year. Um, First one's going to be in February. So I'm just trying to build up some sort of a, a fan base. And um, the goal would be film a special later this year and then, you know, try and, and shop it. And like I said, worst case scenario, put it out for people to see. And I don't know, I, you know, I can't I can't really tour or go on the road because no one knows who I am. So um, I get a lot of offers for like, you can feature and do that kind of thing, but the money is still not there for <laughs> featuring. It's, I don't think it's the price has gone up since like 1984. So uh, it's pretty brutal. Um, so yeah, I don't know, just get to a point where I can headline um, and, you know, not be the bottom feeder where they, they call you and say, Hey, you can do Halloween weekend and we'll give you a thousand dollars. And you're like that. That's not even going to cover for my expenses for everything. So um, that's kind of my goal right now. It's really just to, to get more knowledge of my existence um, to people so that I can try and make a career out of this as opposed to scraping by. <laughs> These are very, very, very <laughs> literal goals that yeah. I appreciate. <laughs> You're like, I just want to be able to live and yeah. get out of the $1,000 weekend bracket, yeah. uh, which I remember that bracket. And that was a very hustle-filled bracket because you, you got to do a lot of math. You got to get on the right flight. 
Yep. You got you can't you can't oh yeah you can't have a thing go wrong if you want to try to come home with money on those thousand dollar fifteen hundred dollar yeah. weekends. And especially now that I have two kids that I have to watch, it's like I'm gonna have to hire someone to watch my kids while my wife is working. So that's you know eight hours a day for several of those days, and uh, yeah, it's it's brutal. Every time people give me advice, where they're like, you just you know what, you just have to go out there, you just do you know, terrible gigs, you know, do a Wednesday night in Chattanooga. And I'm mm-hmm. like, I can't, I can't do that. No, I feel that. Me. Yeah. I was the same way. People were like, you got to go do triple runs and stuff. But, uh, yeah. or, and I was like, I got a kid who needs me there. And yeah. it's, I think, um, I never really got to talk to someone else who went through this, but like, one of the best experiences of my life was the fact that I got to be there with my son just about every day because I was a comedian when he was, bo- you know, born not born, but when I, by the time I started uh, doing comedy, he was already there. So it was nice to be like, oh, man, I get to spend this time. I'm not missing a lot of these first moments that a lot of dads miss, you know, yeah. I think. It, and I wouldn't trade it for the world, even though we were very, you know, broke and poor and not doing well. I wouldn't I still wouldn't trade it at all. Um, and I think that especially now, like trying to go off of uh, advice that works in the past isn't um, does, you know, good, like it's a different world it's a different atmosphere what do you mean like i'm not going to go the like everything kind of shrunk a little bit so why would i go out and do that and struggle and it's not fun and i'm not enjoying my life and i'm missing my kids for this whole bleeding magic pill that someone's going to be like i've seen you out there and fucking bump fuck yeah maryland you're great we're gonna give you a show that's not how that shit happens well and everyone has this ridiculous fantasy where they're like you go, you you know, you you just do a guest spot on a show in Salt Lake City, and the club owner is there, and he also books the club, and he sees you do so well that he invites you back three months later to headline for top dollar, and you're just like, because uh, they pay comedians based on the last they saw them get, like that's, that's yes. not even a realistic fantasy. That's truly, that's one of the best business things I ever figured out early again was that I was like, oh, there's a lot of like mindset of like you you go up, you grind and people just see how good you get at stand up and that's how you get things. And I learned pretty quickly when I was like, just from, and of course, maybe biased towards my own material, but being objective and watching around, being like, oh, wait, no, I know I'm, oh, I know my material. I'm out there on the same nights with this person and I'm crushing them. Like, you know, just, yeah. you know, Rick. And yeah. then being like, oh, it's not about that. It's about like, if I have other credits, if I go out and do it, it's the same thing of you learn from being in your hometown when you're like, oh, they don't respect me here until I go and do things elsewhere. And I felt that with stand-up, which is like, oh, I'm not getting these doors. I mean, the way the comedy, when I'd go around for, like, showcase things at the comedy store compared to after I was on an NBC show, the way the people talked to me there was completely different. Yeah. Yeah. it (laughs) It is. I mean, that's still the way it is for me. Like, if I go to the improv, like, I've had one spot at the improv since covid the everything reopened and i did i had a great set but i know they don't care because i'm not some guy from tv and i don't have uh you know a hundred thousand followers on anything and i mean all that stuff is way more important now yeah and it's and just not, yes if you look if you take your own feelings out of it business-wise it just makes sense yeah. you're like that makes sense i get it you're still going to need quality there because some of these people can't prop up a full show and right. that's fine but the the i think the real trick and the real thing that i've been working on is trying to do is try to be both try to be good and and build your fan base and be popular yeah. um and before i this leaves my mind I don't want to give you advice, but just I when I feel things, I feel things. And when you mentioned the EPs, I love the EP idea. I think that's because I hip hop is my favorite genre. Is what I listen to the most. And the people who are um, the most popular right now, that seems to be how they are um, building their fan base. Is like 
sometimes they'll even go on a concerted thing where they say, Hey, I'm going to drop an EP every month for this year, or I'm going right. to, you know, something like that. So I think if you are to like, you could actually do a lot of stuff from home in LA at the comedy store. If you are continually taping these comedy store, these um, crowd works, maybe build some around the holidays and stuff. And, you know, I know that sounds cheesy. I know it do, but no. I think that's, that's what Gucci man did. He put out an album every Christmas and it works. See, if I could just be the Gucci man of comedy, which a lot of people have been saying, you know, yeah. that's, that's my path. So. Well, I wanted to be that, but you could have it. You could have it. <laughs> <Fair enough. laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. Whatever anyone's offering, you know, I'll take that compliment. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of the plan. It's just, you know, I'm 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 there performing all the time, so no harm in in recording and uh, and just putting it out. If people like it. They like it. If not, then they can listen to something else. There's so much available, and you know, just a matter of finding the right people i think there will be people that enjoy it so it's uh it's a far better plan than the nothing that i've been doing for uh 20 years so yes always an anything plan is better than a nothing plan yeah. that's why i tell myself when i do my twitch and i'm like like uh, play games i'm like oh i play games for two hours and i made like 30 bucks and i'm like well i always go like well you would have played games for two hours and made no money yeah. so <laughs> why not yeah. Why not? Um, oh, let's see what else did I want to ask you, Rick? Uh, what are you? Oh, because we're stuck home a lot right now. What? What's anything that's been inspiring you that you've been watching? Anything that you enjoy? Anything that like? Because I don't. Because you you did a lot of the commercials. I know you did the um the the ringers. But do you, is acting something that you're interested in, or is there writing that you want to do for shows? If you were, I and you don't seem like the vision board type, but maybe I'm just typecasting you. But if we were to build your vision board out, and you were like, this would be where I want to go right now. Is there anything that you see out there that would be a dream for you? I, I would love to do more acting. I. I Part of why I wanted to move to L.A. was I, I had some background in doing acting stuff and uh, even before comedy. But uh, I would love to do that. I, I, you know, I haven't I haven't had a manager or an agent for a long time and I'm terrible at all that stuff. Uh, so a lot of the stuff I get, like I, I did some things over over the pandemic um, for David Spade had a show on uh, Netflix called the after party. Mm -hmm. So they just, they hit me up one day and asked if I'd do it. And so I did a few episodes of that where I'm playing one of the guys in the control room. Um, and he's basically, it's like, he pretends he directs, uh, reality shows. And so they just take real clips and then it's spade basically telling me like, Hey, could you get drunk and start yelling at the other, the other ladies, whatever it is. Um, so that was fun. Like I was loving it. I'd been locked inside for so long. Every time they called me, I was just like, yeah, I'm in whatever. I, um, but I would love more opportunities like that. You know, any sort of acting stuff I'm a hundred percent behind. Uh, I've never, I've never had a job as a writer. Uh, when I was in film school, that was my focus was screenwriting, but I, I'm the worst human being in the history of, of making connections and, um, like people always say, you got to ask for stuff, but it feels, it makes me feel like a fraud. So I'm, I'm like trying to get over the, the self, uh, destruction of being like, if they want me, they'll ask me. And that's mm -hmm. the only way it's going to happen. Um, so uh, I would love to get a job writing for a show. I'd love to act more, all that stuff. I just, um, I'm really just coming to terms with my own resistance of of uh you know having to ask for help i guess so mm -hmm. so it sounds like like uh sabotaging yourself from success yeah i mean essentially that's what it is but i don't know i just it's not even to me i, I just want to be genuine i guess and so mm -hmm. that's what it always feels like i don't want people thinking i'm just trying to use them for uh, you know, a job or whatever it is. But the reality is I, I feel like a lot of people wouldn't feel that way. It's just inside my head. So I would think so, because I mean, it's like I said, 
when I introduced you that one night, I, I mean, you're one of the most talented people I know that, that, be, but you're not conventionally attractive. So the, people don't know you. <laughs> it's the best intro ever. And, and I, and the point being, uh, besides the insult, is that there's no reason, there's nothing, like, there's no skill set, there's nothing that you lack that should be com- stopping you from getting this job. You people enjoy being around you, people like working with you, people enjoy your work, and it's um, it's good. And I think people, you're a mind that if anybody had, like, a sketch show or a um, late night show or so like that, like, you, you're going to bring a different perspective that's going to be um very real and i think very much something that people around the country would relate to because you have such of a background that's the meld of things being from you know kansas being a liberal in kansas being all the things that you are it kind of in some way gives you probably perspective to everything right like yeah so i think that's something that that's quite valuable that people could use and i I know i mean i don't have i mean if i could ever help you in anything one day hopefully i can but if not either way i know sometimes we don't have the biggest listenership but we got some good listeners and if you're one of these listeners who listen to this podcast that work in entertainment look up rick give him a job help him out he's got family that's right (laughs) Do you want my children to starve? This is <laughs> no one wants his children to starve That's or right. be possibly kidnapped by, you know, subpar child care. It happens <laughs> more <laughs> often than you think. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rick. I mean, I really enjoyed talking with you, getting to know you a little bit more. I very yeah, man, much I appreciate it. it. Uh, do you have any questions for me before I ask you our last question? I never ask anyone if they have questions. That's the first um, time. Trying to think, what what are you what are you doing now? Do you have a, a, another special coming out? Uh, right now, I just locked at home. Um, cause uh, with the Omicron and my wife and stuff, we're not really going out much at all. I haven't done any shows since before, like Christmas. Really? Um, yeah, since I did my Christmas show, I haven't done any sets. It's been very depressing for me because it reminds me of that time period of last year when I didn't know when I would ever do sets again and so it kind of uh I guess PTSD for lack of a better term of where I'm like oh fuck is it happening again also I've been acting on this show but um they put us on a hiatus because of of the virus and same thing I mean I guess completely different when it was my slip and slide show when we got canceled because of the diarrhea but it's also classic that's yes. a classic Hollywood tale. Truly. One I mean, if I'm not ingrained in the community now, how <laughs> could you, you guys be like, oh, that's the guy whose show gave 40 people diarrhea and they canceled oh. it. Uh <laughs> well, a- honestly, when that happened, I read, I'm just like, it's horrible that it got canceled, but that's the funniest thing I've ever heard in my life. It's pretty solid. It's I mean, it was loose. It was mostly loose. That's why yeah. it got canceled. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, the comedic, that's the comedic mind right there working its way in uh but so mostly i just been trying to stay focused at home and then trying to finish up on this job whenever they want me to um i think before i'd always try to like be like i gotta go do everything i gotta go do stand up and say and which i still do want to but um i'm just trying to focus on one thing at a time and finish this job up and see Hopefully in the spring, summer, things will be more chill again. I can go out and tour a little bit and, and work on building an hour. I'm kind of just trying to take my time, really, and build something really um, solid and enjoyable. And also, I don't feel like the market's the best right now. So I'm trying to Probably wait, wait it out a little bit. Yeah, I think it's smart. I, I think a lot of people are putting out comedy specials way too often. And obviously, if someone was offering me money, I would put out a comedy special as quickly as they wanted to. But same the the quality of of comedy specials in some ways, I feel like have declined just because people do them every year, which seems absurd to me that people think they have a solid hour of new material every year. That's it's a basic impossibility. But yeah, money talks. So like yeah. I said. <laughs> 
I say that, but I also say I think this year in particular, a lot of a lot of good. I would say last year, year before, hundred percent agreement. This year. A lot of solid ones, like really good ones. Brian Simpson, really good yeah. one. Yeah, Ricky Velez, Roy, Roy Wood. A lot of great ones this year, yeah. I think so. Uh, okay, I'll ask you my last question, which is just for a little piece of advice, a little pearl of wisdom, maybe something passed down to you from generations ago. Maybe something that you teach your daughter or son that you think is important to help our getting better community to continue to get better. I, I mean... I mean, I might be the worst person in the world to ask this question to. I, I feel like I, uh, I lack making the world a better place uh, outside of laughter. But uh, I, honestly, the, the only thing I would say is just be good to people. And there's no reason not to. If someone gives you a reason, don't be nice to them. But for the most part, people just treat them with respect. There's a general lack of respect in the world. It irritates me beyond, you know, anything I can think of outside of that. But just treat people respectfully. Don't, you know, don't act like you're better than people. You're probably not in general, you know. So everyone has their struggles and it's just a matter of, you know, I guess embracing your own personal struggle and, and uh, trying to overcome those things and not burning every bridge on the way. That's something I've, I'm, I'm slowly learning is to not burn every bridge. What did you burn a lot of bridges when you were younger? I feel like I did. I, I, I was a big believer in the general philosophy of it's easiest to burn the bridge when they're building it. And uh, it was kind of a punk rock mentality. I think that I had that, uh, you know, now looking back, I'm just like, there was no reason for a lot of that. It was just like me doing things because I thought it was funny and I knew the three or four people that I was, you know, friends with enjoyed it. And so I was like, Oh, that's funny. Especially with comedians mm -hmm. where, you know, my degenerate comedian friends would be like, dude, that's hilarious. I can't believe you said that to them. I'm like, yeah. And then looking back now, I'm just like, oh, what was I doing? That person didn't deserve that, but just get mature, I guess, older, more mature and realize that, Everyone's struggling, so there's no reason. I agree. Halston, where you got where did you just appear from? I got a question. Um, so years ago, way before I got into um podcast producing, I went to the comedy store and Rick, you had picked me out and you said that I looked like a school shooter. And yeah. I was just wondering, do you stand by it? I, I absolutely do. And when I say that, I, you should know that now when I go on stage, my opening joke is a lot of you are looking at me like I didn't know every mass shooter in America was going to be here. And uh, <laughs> so I, I've turned it into a self-deprecating joke. But I do think that you fit into the same category of um, it could be friendly, but possibly threatening white. So mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, you know, it could go either way. Both He's of just us missing look like, a, a, like a trench coat. Yeah. You put a trench coat on them, maybe give them a bowl haircut. And, uh, you know, that's a dozen people dead, right? There. I have the jacket that I was wearing. Hold on. Oh, this oh, is going to no. be good. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know the jacket. It's, um, I hate this jacket. It's yeah. a pretty crazy, it's a pretty crazy it's jacket. A Johnny Depp jacket. Yeah. Look at this. A giant skull. Are you kidding? Why are yeah. we even asking me if you got that school shooter vibes? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, honestly, the jacket almost makes you seem too cool to be a mm -hmm. school shooter. Laid back. Like he's yeah. got some pot on him. Yeah. It's like this guy, he, he, he probably has some friends, um, but I don't know. I don't own anything that cool. I wear a lot of like black denim jackets to let people know my soul is dead. So maybe that's why I've turned it self-deprecating. I don't believe that at all from your Instagram. <laughs> I, no one will. Nobody believes your soul is dead when you're wearing matching Kansas City Chief outfits with with the onesie from your your son. Yep. Nobody will believe it. No, quit selling it. Yep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the amount of, of Instagram comments I got from people are like, are you the same guy from the comedy store? I'd be like, oh, yeah. 
You got to mix them up a bit. You got to mix the two of those guys. Uh, Rick, where can people find you? Tell us where they want work with who people can track you down. Tell us about the podcast. Um, I'm, I'm at Rick Ingram spelled Ingraham. I N G R A H A M on most social medias. Um, I'm, I perform at the comedy store three, four nights a week at least. And, uh, I have two podcasts, one called the Comedy Store Podcast, where uh, Eleanor Kerrigan and I interview paid regulars from the Comedy Store, and um, we just kind of talk about people's experience at the Comedy Store and in comedy in general. And then I have a newer podcast I've been doing for the last year called Rick Ingram Talks to Strangers, where uh, we just we have people send us a message on uh, Instagram or Twitter saying why I should interview them. And then we bring them into the comedy store and interview them in the podcast studio. And um, it's it's really it's interesting. I, I think it's a really entertaining podcast. And um, I basically just got to the point where I thought every podcast is comedians talking to comedians about comedy. And I have one of those podcasts. So I uh, decided to explore something else. And it's turned out to be really cool. It's uh, I, I think a lot of people who normally we would assume aren't that interesting have very interesting lives and um at least a handful of incidents where you just go yeah you know that's a sitcom worthy event so um it's been cool i've met some cool people and uh met some strange people and um i think it's entertaining so that's called rick ingram talks to strangers and if people want to be on it they just dm uh at ingram pod and they can just tell us who they are and why they would be a good interview. Love it. Follow Rick. Follow the pod. If you want to be on the pod, go ahead. Yeah. Also, when he does the EPs, buy them. Rick's very, very talented. Check him out. Rick, thank you for spending the time with us today. I really appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me, man. I really appreciate it. Of course. Thank you guys for listening. Bye. If you enjoyed this episode, please check out our last episode right over here. Bam! Or perhaps a video picked by our overlords at YouTube. Boop. And don't forget to subscribe. Hit it up. Hit it up. Press the button. Press it! <laughs>